Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The Book of Prayer, the Shaykh uh, Al Hajjawi, may Allah have mercy upon him. Last week we spoke about the conditions of wujub, shurutul wujub. That meant that we were discussing those conditions that if they are found in a person, it means it's obligatory for the person to go and pray Jummah. It's wajib upon them. Today, the author is going to talk about uh, the sihat, surutul sihat, which means that what makes the Jummah valid for the person and the Jummah act in of itself. What are the conditions and descriptions that need to be there for the Jummah itself to be valid? That's what we're going to look at today with Allah's permission, inshallah. So the author, he says, يُشْتَرَتُ لِسِحَّتِهَا شُرُوت It's imperative, it's conditional for it to be correct and valid, certain conditions, شُرُوت So these are the conditions will make Juma valid if they are fulfilled. From them, he says, لَيْسَ مِنْهَا إِذْنُ الْإِمَامِ He says, not from the conditions, and this is something a bit strange, but it comes clear as to why he said it in a moment. لَيْسَ مِنْهَا إِذْنُ الْإِمَامِ It's not a condition for the Juma to be valid, the permission of the Imam. And what he means by Imam here is the authority of the state, that the leader of the state, or the one that is deputized by the leader of the state, that this person's permission is not required. And the evidence for this is in uh, collected by Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and Ibn Mulaqin in Badr al-Munir, he said it's authentic, that Ali radiyallahu anhu salla bin nas wa Uthman radiyallahu anhu mahsur. Tayyib, that Ali radiyallahu anhu, he was not the caliph, but Uthman was the caliph, Uthman was the leader of the state. But Ali radiyallahu anhu prayed in the place of Uthman when Uthman couldn't leave his house. Uthman was confined to his house, so he didn't know that Ali radiyallahu anhu was going to lead the Salatul Jummah, but Ali radiyallahu anhu led it anyway, and this was with Hudur al-Sahaba that many of the Sahaba, majority of them were present and none of them criticized or complained the action of Ali radiallahu anhu. And even when Uthman later on found out, he didn't criticize this action either of Ali radiallahu anhu. So it shows that the permission of the leader is not required. And also the ulama, they say, because this is fardul ayn, this is an obligation which is on each individual, like the five salawata, and likewise in the five salawat, you don't have to seek the permission of the Amir to fulfill the five salawat. Likewise here for Jummah, the permission of the Amir is not sought. However, many of the scholars, not many of them, some of them, they said that it's uh, good and it's recommended to have the permission of the leader of the state if there's going to be more than one Jummah in that state or in that land. Because more than one Jummah, if everybody starts to do their own Jummah, in their own locality as and when they wish that can obviously cause chaos so it's better if there's going to be more than one Jummah that this be under that under the directive of the leader of the state or the uh, ministry of Awqaf the ministry of Islamic affairs etc and the reason that the author Hajjawi may Allah have mercy upon him the reason he mentioned this uh, statement that it's not uh, obligatory to have the permission of the Imam is because to differ with those who said it is obligatory and those are the Hanafi scholars, may Allah have mercy upon them and some of the Hanbali scholars, okay? They have it as a condition to have Jummahs being valid that the permission of the Imam must be there. The, uh, oh, sorry. So he says, Ahaduha al waqt the first of the conditions, or one of the conditions of siha, of the Jummah to be correct and valid, is that the waqt, al-waqt. And if you notice, when we studied the times of the Salah, we said dukhul al-waqt, the entering of the time. And here, with regards to Jummah, he just says al-waqt. The ulama, they mentioned that there's a nukta, there's a reason, a point as to why he said this. And he didn't say dukhul al-waqt. <clears throat> So the Khulul Waqt, like the other prayers, the five Salawat, means that the prayer, though it cannot be done before the time, it can be done due to an excuse outside of the time, meaning that it can be made up or it can be joined outside of the time of the prayer. However, Jummah has only one time, so it cannot be done before that time of Jummah, nor can Jummah be made up if Jummah is missed outside of that time. That's why they say the, the scholars of Fiqh, who mention it in this way, al-waqt, and they don't say dukhul al-waqt, that is the reason why they mention that. The author, he said, وَأَوَّلُهُ أَوَّلُ الْوَقْتِ الصَّلَاةِ الْعِيدِ The first of the 
time, the beginning time of uh, Juma is the beginning time of Salat al-Eid. So the same as when Eid time becomes in, comes in the, the time of Eid Salah, that is the same time that Juma can be prayed according to the author and the majority of the Hanbali scholars. So this is, what is the time of Salat al-Eid? The time of Salat al-Eid is 15 minutes or so after sunrise. Okay, irtifa' al-shams qayd rumh that the sun has risen due to the length of a spear above the horizon to the length of a spear above the horizon and that's around 10 to 15 minutes so this is the mashhur the famous opinion in the madhab that the first the beginning time of juma is that it starts at the beginning time of salat al-eid and from the evidences they use is the hadith in sahih muslim of jabir radiyallahu anhu who said um, he said kan nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yusalli al-juma ثم نذهب إلى جمالنا فنريحها حين تزول الشمس. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Jabir he said in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would pray Salatul Juma, meaning that we would finish with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Salatul Juma, and then we would go to our camels and we would uh, allow them to roam and to relax uh, before the time of Zawal had come in. حين تزول الشمس at the time of Zawal or just before it. So this shows that they would finish praying with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Salah and it would be before the time of Zawal, before the time of Dhuhr uh, which means uh, that it was way before Dhuhr time. Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi rahimahullah ta'ala his opinion in the Madhab was that it's to be held in the sixth hour of the day which is an hour or so before Zawal, okay? The sixth hour of the day, so the day from the time of Fajr up until uh, the time of Dhuhr is divided into six parts and the Jum'ah according to Ibn Qadama will be held in the sixth part of the day and that is roughly like we said an hour or so before the Zawal time, before the time of Dhuhr. Imam al-Mardawi rahimullah ta'ala he said that it starts after Zawal. His opinion was that it starts after Zawal. Shaykh Mut al he mentions an important point, Hafidahullah. He says though the humbly scholars they said the Juma Salah should be before Zawal, meaning that its first time, its beginning time, is at the time when the Eid Salah starts and it's preferred to be before the time of Zawal. Uh, he said, though they say that it's preferred to pray before Zawal, they say, many of them, that it's afdal to pray after Zawal. It's afdal to pray after Zawal, it's better to pray after Zawal, khurujan min al khilaf. Because this takes, the, this takes one out of the difference of opinion that is there with the other scholars. So it could be that in the community you have many people that hold a variety of different opinions but they all tend to agree on the fact that if you pray Juma after Zawal then the Juma there is valid. So though the humbly scholars they say it's preferred to pray before the Zawal, if you were to pray after Zawal that would be better خروجاً من الخلاف because it takes one out of the difference of opinions. And also the scholars they mentioned that if the Adhan for Juma is given before the time of Zawal this would cause tashwish, this would cause confusion for the women in the houses because maybe the women in the houses when they had the adhan they think this is the adhan of Salat al-Dhuhr okay and it's not, it's the adhan for Juma, and then they would go ahead and pray Salat al-Dhuhr so due to these reasons mentioned uh, many of the Hanbali scholars they said it's better, it's preferred to pray Juma uh, at the time of Zawal not before it okay the author he says The last time of the Juma, the end time of, of Juma is the end time of Salatul Dhuhr. Okay, so Juma ends when Salatul Dhuhr ends. When the timing of Dhuhr ends, that is when the time of Salatul Juma has now come to an end. So the question to yourselves pertaining to definition with shadows, as we discussed in the uh, book of timings of Salah. What is the end time of Salatul Juma pertaining to the shadows? Question to yourselves. So, hey, may Allah increase you in good. So, after the fate of Zawal, after the beginning shadow, when the shadow increases to the same length of the object, then that is the time that Juma, uh, that Salatul Dhuhr comes to an end, and also Juma comes to an end, and this is agreed upon by all of the madahib, all the four madhabs. The author he says, فَإِنْ خَرَجَ وَقْتُهَا قَبْلَ تَحْرِيمَةِ صَلُّوا ظُهْرًا وَإِلَّا فَجُمْعَةً That the Juma, if its time goes and the, the people that have gathered for Juma, they didn't manage to get the Takbirat al-Ihram, okay? Then they would have to pray Dhuhr. 
So the people have gathered, okay, and they want to pray Juma, but they didn't realize that they're very late. So by the time they made the Takbirat al-Ihram, now the time for Juma and Dhuhr has finished. So for the, the time for Juma has finished, okay. So now these people, what they have to do, they have to pray Dhuhr. Okay, because the time for Juma has finished. So what he's saying, the author, that if the time for the Juma has finished before they make Takbirat al-Ihram, then they have to go ahead and pray Dhuhr. However, if they were able to catch the Takbirat al-Ihram within the time, and after they've made the Takbirat al-Ihram, the time has elapsed, they can go ahead and they can pray Juma. Because according to the Madhab, the time for a prayer is caught if you manage to catch the Takbirat al-Ihram uh, in that time, okay? So as long as you got the Takbirat al-Ihram before the time of the prayer elapses, then you are considered according to the Madhab as having caught that particular Salah with regards to its timing, okay? With regards to the timing. Ibn Taymiyyah, as a second opinion in the Madhab, he said this is not the case, it's only the case if you catch a full Raka, if you catch a full Ruku with the Sujuds of that unit, of that Raka, uh, in the timing of the Salah before the time elapses. That is the only time you will catch the uh, Salah. However, the author and the majority in the Madhab, they say as long as you get the Takbirat al-Ihram before the time elapses, then you would pray it as Jummah. Otherwise, if you missed it uh, in the time, you would have to pray it as Dhuhr. You would have to pray it as Dhuhr. The author, he says, the second condition for the validity of the Juma is Hudur Arba'in min Ahli Wajubiha. Is that 40 people have to attend the Juma and the Khutbah, not just the Juma Salah, also the Khutbah. 40 people have to attend it, these acts of worship, in order for it to be valid. Okay? And not just any 40 people, rather, as we discussed in the previous lesson, they must be from the 40 people who the conditions of Wajub fall upon them. So they cannot be travelers. They cannot be women, they cannot be the slaves, for example. So if you had 40 people gathered and they were travelers or they were slaves and they were women, they wouldn't be considered as being the number required for Juma to be obligatory, okay? For Juma to be correct. So for Juma to be correct, it has to be 40 from Ahlul Wujubiha, from the people that we discussed in the previous lesson uh, for whom Juma would be obligatory upon them, okay? This is for the Khutbah and the Salah. From the evidences of this is what is narrated by Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Ibn Hibban, Ibn Khuzayma, and Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala said it's authentic that Sa'ad Sa'd ibn Zarara, he was awlu man jama'a, he was the first of the people that gathered the people together for Jum'ah in Medina before the Prophet sallallahu got there. Kana yusalli al-Jum'ah fi harrati bani bayada. They used to pray Jum'ah in the place of Bani. Bayada and the narrator of the hadith, Kabil Malik, I believe it was, the narrator of the hadith, they said at that time there were 40 people present. Okay, 40 people had attended the Salatul Jummah. So this is one of the evidences wherein they say that 40 people upon whom it's obligatory have to be there for the Salatul Jummah to be valid. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, as a second opinion in the Madhab, he holds that it's only three. Okay, a huge discrepancy between 40 and three. So he says, according to him, that it's only three. And the reason that he gives behind that, he says that the least of jama'a, okay, because if the call to jama'a is made, fas'aw and fas'aw, the verb, the command is given in a plural sense. And Ibn Taymiyyah says that the least of plural is two, okay? So that the least of the plural is two. So as long as two people uh, from whom it's wajib upon are there, then Juma can be established, and the third has to be the Imam, of course. Okay? First out ila dhikrillah, then go forth to the dhikr of Allah, the one who will do the dhikr of Allah, the khutbah, is the Imam. So two uh, who would listen, and two, uh, and then the Imam who's going to be there as the third to uh, yani do the khutbah and to lead the prayer. So that was the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. And as we said, the Madhab's opinion is that 40 people, min ahli wujubiha, 40 people whom it's obligatory to pray Juma, they have to be there. The third condition for its validity, the author says, The third of these conditions for the Juma to be valid is that these people, okay, they have to be Mustawtinin and they have to be in a Qarya. 
So the first thing, the Qarya, the word Qarya, normally it's understood in the Arabic language to mean village. But here the intention is not to use it as its meaning of village. Rather it means a land, whether the land is small or the land is large. So the ulama, they say, for example, in Surah Shura, Allah says, لِتُنْدِرَ أُمُّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا That you warn the Umm Al-Qura, the people of Umm Al-Qura. And Umm Al-Qura, as we know, is Mecca. And Mecca is much larger than a village, okay? And also, of course, the surrounding areas uh, mentioned in the ayah. So they say village here, Al-Qura or Al-Qarya, doesn't uh, necessitate its uh, linguistic meaning. Rather, it means a land, whether it's a large land or a small land. So the people of this land, they have to be mustawtineen, as we took in the previous lesson, that from the conditions of wujub, from the conditions of obligation upon the people, is that they are mustawtin. And mustawtin is that they are residents of that land. That is their land that they live in. They are not musafirin, they are not travelers who can shorten the prayer, nor are they muqimin. So muqimin is those people who live in a land like in muaqqatan, for a, for a limited time period. It could be a few months, it could be a few days, it could be a few years. So no, it's not their land, they're either they're working for a short period of time or studying or something of that nature. But the land is not theirs, they're, they're not nationals of that land. Okay, so the word mustawtinin that he mentions uh, excludes people like the traveller, it excludes those who are muqimin, those who are there for a temporary period of time. And of course it excludes those who are Bedouins, who never really stay in one place, they move around. Uh, from different parts of the year, from land to land. So that's the third condition, that the people must be in the Qarya, they must be of that land, and they must be mustawtinin of that land, meaning that they must be residents of that land. طيب. The author, he says, وَتَسِحُّ فِي مَا قَارَبَ الْبُنْيَانِ مِنْ سحراء. That the Salatul Jummah and the Khutbah, it's permissible to have outside of the Masjid. It doesn't have to be inside of the bunyan, inside of a building structure. It can be out in the Sahara, it can be out in the desert, as long as the, as long as the place that they are praying is close to the land. And some of the ulama, they say it has to be affiliated to the land. Like for example, we have Musalla of Eid. Okay, we have the outdoor praying of Salat al-Eid. So the outdoor praying of Salat al-Eid is normally affiliated to a particular area. It's normally affiliated to a particular land. So as long as it's like that and it's not too far, then the people, they can go outside and they can pray the Salatul Jummah uh, outside. And Sheikh uh, Mutlaq Jasr, uh, Hafidhullah, he said it shouldn't be further than the Farsakh. And as we mentioned, Farsakh is around three miles. And again, the proof of this they get from the same hadith I mentioned previously, the hadith in Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Ibn Hibban and others, where um, uh, Sa'd Ibn Zarara, he was awwal man jama'a. He was the first person in Medina that brought the people together and prayed Jummah with them. Kanu yusalli al-Jummah fi harrati bani bayada. They prayed in the place known as Harra bani bayada. And Imam al-Khattabi, in, uh, Imam al-Khattabi, he said in Mu'al Musunan that this was around a mile or so outside of Medina. So they're saying that it shouldn't be further than that because that's where the companions, radiyallahu anhum, did it. They didn't do it too far. As long as it's close to the, the built-up area of the land, then it's permissible for people to leave the built-up area of the land, the buildings, and to go out into the open and to pray Jummah in the open. The author, he says now, فَإِن نَقَصُوا قَبْلَ إِتْمَامِهَا إِسْتَعْنَفُوا ظُهْرًا إِن نَقَصُوا قَبْلَ إِتْمَامِهَا If the added, if the required number, which is 40, decreases قَبْلَ إِتْمَامِهَا before the Jummah Salah or the Khutbah is uh, finished, إِسْتَعْنَفُوا ظُهْرًا then they would have to repeat the Salah as Dhuhr rather than as Juma. So you can imagine a scenario, the ulama they explain, if there's 40 people, the Imam he sees 40 people, so he goes ahead and he starts the Khutbah or he starts the Salatul Juma. And then he notices that one of the people has left uh, because he's broken his wudu or something of that nature. So in this situation, the Imam he has to now complete the Juma as a Nafal, but then pray dhuhr after that because the condition and we know that one of the descriptions of a condition a shart is that the shart has to be there continual throughout the act of worship so here the shart the condition of having 40 people it had khalal okay it had um, it was broken during the act of worship so if the condition is broken during the act of worship it means the act of worship is not going to be valid so therefore, if the Imam, he sees that somebody has left from amongst the 40 and they've now gone under 40, 
they've gone to 39 or whatever number, then the, uh, the Salah has to be prayed as Dhuhr. Unless, the ulama say, unless there's enough time for Salatul Jummah to be re-prayed. So if the number went down to 39, but then that person comes back and there's time enough to pray Salatul Jummah, again as, as 40, then they would go ahead and repeat the Salatul Jummah as 40. The point being that this condition of having 40 has to be there from the beginning to the end of the act of worship. And if it is broken, in Naqasu, if it goes lower than 40, uh, whilst the act of worship is taking place, istanafu dhuhran. Then they would start the prayer again as dhuhr after completing the Juma prayer as a nafil. And that's what we understood. The ulama they said, such as Sheikh Fahd al Mutir, we understood from when he said istanafu dhuhran, dhuhran, that they repeated, they started again as dhuhr. We understand from this phrase of the Imam that they complete Salatul Juma as nafil and then they start uh, Salatul Dhuhr after that. Another opinion in the madhab chosen by Imam Ibn Qudama rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that rather if the congregation has prayed a whole rak'ah with 40 people there and after having prayed a whole rak'ah, rak'ah it goes down below 40, then that doesn't affect the validity of the Salatul Jummah. So as long as 40 people prayed at least one rak'ah, according to Imam Ibn Qudama, then, then the Jummah should be completed as Jummah and it doesn't have to be completed as dhuhr if the number 40 decreases whilst the act of worship is taking place. The author, he says, وَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ مَعَ الْإِمَامِ مِنْهَا رَكْعَةً أَتَمَّهَا جُمَعَ And whoever catches with the Imam, meaning he's prayed with the Imam, a rak'ah, okay, a complete rak'ah, then he would complete it as Jummah. So maybe he missed one rak'ah, but he got one complete rak'ah with the Imam, then this person completes it as Jummah. However, if the person catches less than one rak'ah with the Imam from Salatul Jummah, then this person has to then complete Jummah as Dhuhr. But with the condition, إِذَا كَانَ نَوَى ظُهْرًا If the person intends it as Dhuhr. So just a quick recap of what the author is saying in this statement before we give further explanation, because it can be a bit complicated. He says, whoever catches a raka or more with the Imam from Juma, then he completes the Salah as Salatul Juma. However, if the person catches less than a raka from Salatul Juma with the Imam, then he has to complete it as Dhuhr. Okay, إِذَا كَانَ نَوَى ظُهْر As long as he intended Salatul Dhuhr for uh, the part that he caught with the Imam. So the ulama, they explained that the Musbuk, and Musbuk as we know is the one that has missed a part of the Salah with the Imam, the Musbuk in Juma he has two situations. The first of them is that he catches a rak'ah with the Imam, okay? So this person, he's caught one rak'ah with the Imam, he missed the khutbah, it doesn't matter, as long as he caught one rak'ah with the Imam, it does matter in the sense that it's something which should never uh, optionally be done, but if it happened out of his control that he missed the khutbah, he got there late, and he manages to catch a rak'ah with the Imam, then he can still complete the Salah as Salatul Jummah. Because in the hadith collected by Imam Nasa'i, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and Shaykh Al-Albani said it's authentic, Man adraka rak'atan min al-jum'ati, faqad adraka al-jum'a. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever has caught a rak'ah from Salatul Jummah, then he is considered as having caught the Jummah, meaning he should go ahead and complete it as Jummah. So that's the situation of the Masbuk who catches one rak'ah at least with the Imam. Tayyib. The second situation of the Masbuk is that this person catches less than a rak'ah. Okay? So this person, he has to now pray Dhuhr. He has to now pray Dhuhr instead of Jummah because he caught less than a rak'ah. However, here there's two qaydin, there's qaydin, there's two qayyud, there's two restrictions or two matters that have to be present for him to be able to pray as Dhuhr. Tayyib. The first of them is that this person who caught less than a rak'ah with the imam, he had to have intended what he's praying now to be Salatul Dhuhr, okay, and not Salatul Jummah. So if this person, he catches the imam after the imam has risen from the second rak'ah, okay, then in this situation, he has to intend what he's going to pray now is Salatul Jummah, okay, for him to, to be able to pray four rak'ah of, uh, sorry, he has to intend now what he's going to pray is Salatul Dhuhr for him to be able to pray the four rak'ah of dhuhr. However, if he didn't do that, he comes into the salah, he makes the takbirat al-ihram, and the imam, 
has come up from the second rakah and he intends that this is going to be Juma, then for this person, it's not going to be valid for him to pray this as now Salatul Dhuhr. Rather, he has to uh, he has to finish the Salah as a Nafal and then he has to start the Salah again as Dhuhr after the Taslim of the Imam, right? So the way to get it correct, the way to get the Niyyah correct for the person to be able to pray what he's caught, which is less than a Raka from the Jummah, to pray that now as Dhuhr, is that what he does when he comes to the Salah and he sees the Imam getting up uh, yani from the Ruku. Here he has to wait and see is this now the Imam's first raka or is it the second raka? So for example, if the Imam goes into the into the tashahud after making the ruku and going into the sujood, then he knows that well actually he's missed uh, two raka. Okay, he's missed uh, two raka and there's no way he can get one raka. But if he sees the Imam after doing his sujood, uh, he goes back into the second raka. Then he knows he can join the Imam as salatul juma. So he goes ahead and joins the Imam as Salatul Jummah and there's no problem here, he just makes up the second Raka'ah. But in the situation where it's complicated is where he finds, he has to wait to see if the Imam goes into, into Tashahud or not. If the Imam goes into Tashahud, it means that he has to join the Imam now in the Tashahud with the intention of Salatul Dhuhr and then he carries on as Salatul Dhuhr from there. Okay, so he has to have the Niyyah of uh, joining the prayer, the Juma prayer, as Salatul Dhuhr, if he's missed more than if he's missed uh, two raka with the Imam, meaning he's unable to pray at least one raka with the Imam from Salatul Juma, then he has to join with the intention with the niyyah of Dhuhr, as Salat. Taib, Sheikh Uthaymin has a secondary opinion in the Madhab because he said that this is very complicated for the people to do, that most of the people, the Awam, the general people, they won't know these rulings. So he said, what the people for the awam, the general people, what they do is that they come and they join the salah as with the niyyah of Juma, okay? As normal. They join the salah normal uh, with the niyyah of Juma. And when they've come to realize that hang about, we didn't catch a raka with the imam, the imam has now gone into the shahud. When the imam comes to make taslim, they make taslim also with the imam. But at this point, sorry, once the imam, imam has made taslim, at this point, they are allowed to change their intention from Juma to Salatul Dhuhr. And he said this is easier for the people because it's going from the Asl, which is Juma, to the Badal, which is uh, it's going from the Badal, which is uh, Dhuhr. Okay. No, he said it's going from the Badal, from the replacement, which is Juma, to the Asl, which is Dhuhr. And he said herein there's no problem. Because uh, the asal, the original prayer was Dhuhr and the replacement for it in this time is Salatul Juma. So the person, he has the intention of praying Juma. He realizes by the time the Imam's got to the Taslim that hang about, I didn't catch one rakat with the Imam. So I have to now pray it as Dhuhr. So all he has to do at that point when the Imam makes Taslim, he has to change the intention from Juma to Salatul Dhuhr. Because as Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said that the Badal is Juma, that the replacement was Juma and the Asl is Dhuhr. So all he's doing, he's going from the Badal to the Asl and there's no problem in that whatsoever according to Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimullah Ta'ala and he said also that both of these prayers uh, Fard al-Waqt that both of these prayers in this time both of them are valid as uh, Fard prayers in this time so there's no issue for the person to do it the easier way which is as I described that wh whatever he catches from the Imam he intends to be Juma, and if he finds that actually he didn't pray uh, more than a raka'ah with the Imam, then when the Imam makes taslim, he changes his intention from Juma to Dhuhr and he goes ahead and he completes the Salah with four raka'at as Dhuhr and that is what Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimahullah Ta'ala said would be easier for the people and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. Now going back to what the Madhab says, the second condition, I said there's two uh, qaid, there's two restrictions that need to be present for the person to change from uh, to, for the person to be able to pray to continue with what he caught with the Imam which was less than a raka to continue that as Salatul Dhuhr we said that the first condition was that the intention of Dhuhr had to be there right for that part which he caught with the uh, Imam from Juma, which was less than a raka the second qaid the second restriction that has to be there is to ensure that what he's praying uh, from Dhuhr is in the time of Dhuhr because as we said many of the Hanbali scholars they said it's better to pray uh, before the Waqt al-Zawal Okay, they would they they pray uh, Salatul Juma before Waqt al-Zawal, which means that it's before the time of uh, Dhuhr. Therefore, 
that if the person intends that he's going to pray he's going to pray dhuhr meaning that he's missed more than um, he's missed the two rakah and he wants to pray dhuhr this is only going to be valid if it's in the time of salatul dhuhr uh, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr, he mentions the point and he asked, the, he mentions the point which is that what else can the uh, masbuk, the one that has missed a prayer with uh, the Imam do with regards to Juma? What else can he do in the sense of, apart from changing his intention to Salat al-Dhuhr, what else can he do? And in fact, this is something that he must do. Question to yourselves, is there something else that the Musalli, the masbuk, can do rather than changing his intention to Salat al-Dhuhr? Is there something else he can do pertaining to his Juma prayer? There's something else that he must do. Question to yourselves. If he's able to do it. Tayyib, So what Shaykh Abdul Salam is saying, Shawair, he's saying before the person goes ahead and prays Salat al-Dhuhr instead of Salat al-Jumma because he missed Juma, right? He's in the situation, he's missed Salat al-Jumma with the Imam. He's only caught a little bit of the Salah. He didn't catch a whole raka, at least with the Imam. So he's not able to pray now Salat al-Jumma. His situation is that he's going to pray Salat al-Dhuhr with the conditions that I mentioned. Shaykh Abdul Salam Shawaid says before he does that, he has to ensure in of himself that there's no other masjid nearby where the khutbah or the salah is still taking place that he can get to. So for example, many of us who live in Qatar, we can hear that once our imam has finished the salah, the other imam down the road is still giving the khutbah. So in that situation, Abdul Salam al-Shawair, Hafizullah, is saying that the person has to leave that salah and then go and join the Jummah which is still hasn't taken place or still hasn't finished and he's able to catch a rakah or more in that masjid. That's what's obligatory upon the person rather than going to pray it as or complete it as Salat as dhuhr But of course, if the person is in a situation like in the West where the masajid are miles away from each other and there's no way he can get to another Jummah, then he would do what we described in these details that he goes ahead and he continues the salah as salat al dhuhr and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Taib shabab. The author now is going to mention the fourth condition for the validity of salat al jumma and he's going to mention that that is that the khutbah has to be there, the two khutbah. This is the fourth condition for salat al jumma to be valid. But before we, I discuss this fourth condition which is pertaining to the khutbah itself, okay? Shaykh Mutaq Jasr, Hafizullah Ta'ala, he said that there's 10 issues or conditions pertaining to the khutbah. And these are important to mention, okay? Our Imam is going to mention, I believe, he mentions five, but uh, Shaykh Mutaq Jasr, he says that the humble scholars in general, they mention 10 conditions pertaining to the validity of the khutbah. So I'll mention these first before we go and discuss what the, our author has mentioned step by step. So, Shaykh Mutlaq Jasr, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, he said that there's 10 conditions and they must be in each of the khutbahs, in the first part of the khutbah and the second part of the khutbah. From them is Dukhul al waqt that the khutbah has to be in the time of Salat al Jummah, obviously. The second of them, he says, Jawazul Imamati Khatibi Fiha, that it has to be that the khatib is valid as being a khatib. So if you remember in the previous lesson that we took, I gave you a scenario where you may have a scholar that is traveling to a particular land and though he, he's a traveler, so it's not valid for him now to be the Imam and it's not valid for him to be the Khatib. So the Khatib has to be from those who Salat al-Jumma is obligatory upon him, okay? Therefore, he can be the Imam. So he can't be a traveler, he can't, obviously it can't be a woman that is well known and it can't be a slave either. Tayyib. The third condition is that there has to be Alhamdulillah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has to be praised in both of the khutbahs. The fourth of them is that there has to be salat ala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in both of them. And the fifth of them that there has to be qira'atu ayah. There has to be one ayah at least which is recited in both of the khutbah, in each of the khutbah. The sixth of these conditions is that there has to be wasiyatu bi taqwa Allah ta'ala. That there has to be an admonition to have taqwa of Allah in both of the khutbahs, okay? So now this wasiyatu bi taqwa Allah azawajal, the admonition for the people to have taqwa of Allah azawajal, it doesn't have to literally mention the word ittaqullah or anything of that nature. It doesn't have to have the word uh, taqwa mentioned in it, but rather the meaning of fearing up for Allah azawajal and being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitting to him has to be there in the admonition, okay? So it could be any a phrase that alludes to the meaning of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
The seventh of these conditions is Hudur al-Adl al-Mushtarat is that there has to be 40 people there in both parts of the khutbah. So if any part of the khutbah less than 40 people, then the khutbah, beca- khutbah, khutbah becomes invalid. The eighth condition is al-jahru bihaythu yusma' al-adl al-add min al-hadirin. Al-jahru bihaythu yusma' adadan min min al-hadirin. That um, the Sheikh here is saying that the khutbah has to be loud enough for at least a group of the people that are present to have heard. So if the person doesn't have the microphone and he has a very soft voice, he's whispering and nobody can hear him, then the khutbah is going to be invalid because the maqsood, the objective of the, of the khutbah is to give an admonition. And if nobody is able to hear the admonition, then it means the khutbah is not going to be valid. The ninth of them is that there has to be niyat al-khutbah, that the person has to intend that this admonition is khutbah. So the ulama, they say, say for example, in some countries, okay, and it's not correct uh, to my understanding, that people they give like a small dars before the khutbah right they give like a lecture before they start the khutbah and, and some of the uh, people that do this is very strange they will give you a half an hour dars before the khutbah and the khutbah will itself will only last like two or three minutes so they change their affairs and they make them upside down so it could be that a person gives this dars and then he says okay i've given the admonition there's no need for a khutbah now uh, let's go ahead and just start the prayer so this would be invalid, rather there has to be a niyat al-khutbah, that what you were giving as a dars, you didn't have niyat al-khutbah, you didn't have the intention for khutbah, so it's not going to be valid. And also the last of these conditions that Sheikh uh, Mutlaq Jasr mentions is al-muwalatu bayn al-khutbati wa salah, that there has to be continuity between the khutbah, both of them, and in of themselves, that khutbah one and khutbah two, there has to be muwalat, continuity, and also be- between these two and the salah. There has to be continuity, okay? Because these acts of worship, they are connected. And there has to be mu'alat, wherein that the break between them shouldn't be long. So if any of these conditions are not there, then the khutbah and the, will be invalid. The khutbah will be invalid. And also, of course, if the khutbah is invalid, then the salatul juma would also be invalid. The author, he says, now going into the explaining the condition, the fourth condition, It's conditional for the Jummah to be valid that the two khutbahs precede the Salatul Jummah. And from the evidences of this, the clear evidence, as we know in Surah Al-Jummah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِيَ لِصْلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْأَوْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ لَا أَوْيُهُ بَلِيفِ If the call to the Jummah Salah is given, then fas'au, then raise to the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said that the dhikr is the khutbah. وَالْأَمْرُ بِسَعْيِ لَهَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى وَجُوبِهَا وَشَرْطِيَّتِهَا And the command to raise towards the uh, dhikr of Allah azawajal shows that it's an obligation and that it's a condition. Okay? Shows that it's something that has to be there. And also in the hadith in Bukhari Muslim, we have the hadith of uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يخطب خطبتين ثم يقعد بينهما يقعد بينهما that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to give two khutbah and he would sit uh, between them. So this was something which was always done. There's muwadhaba of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and in general when there's muwadhaba when there's continuation of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم upon, upon an action then this shows that it's something which is uh, an obligation. It shows that it's an obligation because the Prophet ﷺ never left it. And Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, he mentions an interesting point. He says, فعل المضارع, that the present continuous tense in um, in uh, the Arabic language. So in the hadith, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يخطبو. يخطبو is فعل مضارع, is present continuous that the Prophet ﷺ used to give khutbah, right? إِذَا دَخَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ كَانَ So if kana precedes this fi'l mudariya, the word kana, uh, فَإِنَّهُ يَدُلُّ يَدُلُّ عَلَى الْدَيْمُومَ Then this uh, alludes to the fact that this is something which is always done, that the Prophet ﷺ would always do. So kana in this hadith is there upon the fi'l mudariya, yakhtub, which shows that the Prophet ﷺ would always give the khutbah on Salatul Jummah, which then indicates that it's something which shouldn't be left off, it's something which is conditional. 
The author, he says, وَمِنْ شَرْطِ صِحَتِهِمَا And from the conditions of the validity of the Salatul Jummah, he's going to mention five now, though we mentioned ten uh, as extra information. He's going to mention five. And Uthaymin, he mentions that the min here, وَمِنْ شَرْطِ صِحَتِهِمَا The min, the from in the Arabic language, is بِمَعْنَى uh, tab'id. It has the meaning of tab'id, which means that there's more than this. Okay, it indicates that there's more than this, which is exactly what we mentioned. We mentioned five more than what the author is going to mention. من شرط صحتهما حمد الله تعالى From the conditions of the validity of the Jummah is that Allah Azawajal must be praised in both parts of the khutbah. حمد الله تعالى وصلاة على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم And there must be sending of salutations, sending of salawat upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وَقِرَاءَةُ آيَةٍ And there must be an ayah that is recited in each of the uh, khutbahs. وَالْوَصِيَّتُهُ بِتَقْوَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And there must be an admonition for the people to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So according to the mashhur opinion in the madhab, these four, they are arkan of the khutbah. They are pillars of the khutbah. Okay, they have to be there for the khutbah to be valid. Regarding the hamd, the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ulama, they say that the sunnah is to have it in the beginning of the khutbah. Okay, the sunnah is to have the praise of Allah Azawajal in the beginning of the khutbah. Regarding the point of an ayah being there in each of the khutbah, the ayah has to be what they say, mustaqil al-ma'na. Mustaqil al-ma'na, that the verse has to make sense in of itself, okay? Not like, for example, you might say, mudhamatan. Mudhamatan in of itself doesn't make any sense, right? It's describing that which came before it. So, the, the verse has to be mustaqil al-ma'na, that the verse in of itself has to be valid in terms of meaning. And with regards to the taqwa of Allah Azawajal, as we mentioned in the khutbah, that it's to be an admonition for the people to fear Allah Azawajal and to worship Allah Azawajal. And there is no better mawidha, no better admonition than advising people to fear Allah Azawajal, ittaqillah, in the variety of different forms that it comes. Okay, to fear, have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that the khutbah is valid even in the absence of these arkan, even in the absence of these pillars according to Ibn Taymiyyah, right? Because he said that as long as there is admonition, that you are admonishing the people, telling them something which is beneficial, beneficial to their deen, connecting them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as long as the people understand that urfan, that customarily this is a khutbah, then that is what suffices, okay? Uh, a point to add also is that the humbly scholars, they uh, insist or they say it's a condition that the, um, the khutbah has to be in Arabic, okay? The khutbah has to be in Arabic, at least the four pillars that have been mentioned. The hamd of Allah Azawajal, the salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu the admission, admonition to have taqwa and the fourth of them also, okay? Which was qiratul uh, ayah, to have a, a verse recited. So all of these have to be in Arabic according to the humbly scholars. Some of the contemporary humble scholars, the uh, scholars of our time, they say if the people don't understand the language, then they can give the khutbah in any language uh, which they are able to understand. However, at least they should try to at least get these arkan, these pillars said in Arabic, which is not very difficult at all. And it's also permissible for a person to read the khutbah from a piece of paper. It doesn't have to always be done from memory. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَهَدُورْ الْعَدَدْ الْمُشْتَرَطْ and that there has to be 40 people that are there for both of the khutbahs. So as we said, if somebody left okay, from one of the khutbahs, then that would invalidate the khutbah, which would then invalidate Salatul Jummah as a whole. Okay, So there have to be 40 people there for both of the khutbahs. وَلَا يُشْتَرَطُ لَهَا وَلَا يُشْتَرَطُ لَهُمَا الطَّهَارَةُ But it's not a condition that tahara, that purification from Haddat al-Asghar or Akbar has to be there. Okay, because they say that this is dhikr, that the khutbah is dhikr, and dhikr is not uh, conditioned upon uh, having tahara from hadith al-asghar or hadith al-akbar. Okay, this is the opinion of the madhab. However, Ibn Qadam rahimullah ta'ala, he says that tahara from hadith al-akbar has to be there. So anything which necessitates a ghusl, you have to make ghusl from that thing. Okay, the lifting of janaba. The reason he says this, he says that the ayah is a rukan, Reciting an ayah from the Quran is a rukan of the khutbah. And the junab, the one in the state of Junaba, is not allowed to recite the Quran. Therefore, you have to have tahara from hadith al-akbar 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That was according to Ibn Qudama. The author he says, It's also not a condition for the validity of the Juma of the Khutbah, that whoever gave the Khutbah has to then lead the Salah. They can be two different people, okay? Because they are two separate acts of worship. Uh, it's like, for example, uh, if one uh, didn't attend the Khutbah, right? Not intentionally, he didn't attend the Khutbah, but then his Salah is still going to be valid. They say likewise for the Khatib and the Imama. They say that uh, the Khatib doesn't have to lead the Salah. Okay, they can be two different people. Okay, making qiyas upon the Ma'mum who didn't attend the Khutbah. However, he attended the Salah. His Salah is still valid even though he missed the Khutbah. So this is the qiyas they use that uh, both that the one who does the Khutbah and the Salah doesn't have to be the same person. It's preferred, however, to be the same person, but it doesn't have to be. And Shaykh Uthaymeen, he went even further and he said, even the two parts of the Khutbah, it can be done by two separate people, okay? Two people can, if it happened to take place for whatever reason, that two people can do each part separately if they wish to do so. Each person doing one part of the Khutbah if they wish to do so. The author now, he's going to now speak about a few of the Sunan pertaining to the Khutbah before we end, inshallah. He says, وَمِن سُنَّنِهَا أَنْ يَخْتُبَا عَلَى مِنْبَرِ it's sunnah to make khutbah upon a member because in Bukhari, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, كان جدع, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, كان جدع يقوم إليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما وضع له المنبر سمعنا للجدع مثل الأصوات العشار حتى نزل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فوضع يده عليه سبحان الله. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to give khutbah upon uh, leaning against the, the palm tree, okay, leaning against some type of uh, tree. And when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had a member made from him, وسلم, he left the tree and he went to go and give khutbah upon the member. There was a clear uh, crying sound heard from the, uh, from the tree until the Prophet وسلم, went back to the tree to calm it down and that's when it stopped crying. وسلم. So it's sunnah to give khutbah on a member, okay? And the member, as Sheikh Abdul Salam al mentioned, it doesn't have to be three steps. So it could be any type of member. Or upon a raised platform of some sort because the objective is that the people see you and that your voice travels. Okay. And it's sunnah that the person who's given the khatib that when he yani, uh, gets upon the member that he gives salam to the congregation. Okay, he gives salam to the congregation. And then he sits until the adhan is finished. And he uses this time not only to repeat the words of the adhan, but also to think about what he's going to say and to gather his thoughts and to collect himself so that he's prepared to give the khutbah. And he sits between the two khutbahs. Okay? This is also a sunnah. It's not obligatory, it's a sunnah. Uh, Jabir ibn Sumra, he said, as in Sahih Muslim, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يخطب قائما that the Prophet وسلم, he would give the khutbah while standing. ثُمَّ يَجْلِسُوا ثُمَّ يَقُومُوا فَيَخْتُبُوا قَائِمًا And then he would sit down, and then again he would stand, and he would give the khutbah standing. So, and then Jabir said, فَمَنْ نَبَّأَكَ أَنَّهُ خَطَبَ جَالِسًا فَكَذَبَ فَوَاللَّهِ قَدْ صَلَيْتُ مَعْهُ أَلْفِ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ أَلْفَيْ صَلَاءَ uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, whoever told you that the Prophet وسلم, gave the khutbah sitting down, then verily he has told you a lie. For verily by Allah, I prayed with the Prophet وسلم, more than a thousand times. And this is what the Prophet وسلم, used to do. He used to give khutbah standing and then he would sit and then he would stand again. And uh, so that was the uh, evidence pertaining to that he should sit between the two khutbahs. And also it's an evidence for the second point, which is that the author says, وَيَخْتُبَ قَائِمًا That the uh, Imam... He should give the khutbah standing up. Okay, so th this is a sunnah that should be implemented. And also an evidence for it being a sunnah, which is interesting, is that in the ayah, وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهُونٍ فَضُّ إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا That the munafiqeen or the people weak of iman, when they see uh, trade taking place, or there is some kind of amusement, uh, they leave you and they leave you standing. Okay, so here, the description given of the Prophet وسلم, is a description that he's left standing, okay? And in the Arabic, uh, in the rules of fiqh, it's understood that this is an action, okay? The description of the Prophet وسلم, standing is a fi'l, and the fi'l, there's no wujub for a fi'l, there's no 
obligation for the, for the action in of itself being just because it's an action. So the ulama, they say just because it's an action, it doesn't allude to that it's obligatory. So it's taken as being something which is mustahab. So in the verse, the Prophet ﷺ was described as standing and his description is an action. And an action in of itself in the rules of fiqh doesn't allude to something being as um, an obligation. So rather it's taken as something which is mustahab, something which is sunnah and recommended. طيب. And uh, another riwayah in the madhab of Imam Ahmad is that the qiyam hal al khutbah is wajib, that standing in the khutbah is something which is wajib, but this is not the majority opinion amongst the Hanbali scholars. The author he says, وَيَعْتَمِدُوا عَلَى سَيْفْ أَوْ قَوْسٍ أَوْ عَصَى The person he stands and leans upon a sword or he leans upon a, a bow, okay, which is used in archery, or he leans upon a stick, okay. Sheikh Abdul Salam al he mentions a very interesting point. He says, المسألة, He says, The reality or the correct understanding of this mas'ala is as follows. He says that the choice here of these three things to stand upon, to lean upon a sword or a bow or upon a stick is not tashahi. It's not that you have the choice of I can choose one of these three things. He says, Rather, Rather, it's a choice of situation. So for example, the people of jihad, when the time was they're in jihad, they would be using swords. They would, their situation would be, this, their hal would be that they would have swords with them. So they would lean upon the sword. So it's not that today in our khutbah, somebody comes along with a sword and leans on the sword. This wouldn't be a right. Rather, in today's situation, what would be normal is for a person to lean upon a stick. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And then the Shaykh Abdul Salam al he said, فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ إِنْدَهُ عَصَى فَقَالُوا يُرْسِلْ يَدَيْهِ مَعًا If the person doesn't have something to lean upon like a stick, then he puts both of his hands by his side. أَوْ يَقْبِدُ الْيُمْنَ بِالْيُسْرَى Or he uh, grabs the hands as follows, okay? He grabs the right and the left as follows. كَهَيْئَةِ الْمُصَلِّي Like the person when he's in salah, his two hands are together like that. That's how the person would have his hands whilst giving the khutbah, if not at his sides, if he doesn't have something to lean on. وَيَقْصِدَ تِلْقَاءَ وَجْهِهِ And also from the sunnah of the khutbah is that the person, the khatib, he looks in front of him. He doesn't look to the left and the right because looking to the left and the right, حَالُ khutbah during the khutbah is something which is makruh in the madhab. And in fact, it's makruh according to the majority, apart from the Hanafi scholars, may Allah have mercy upon them. And also from the sunnah of the khutbah, وَيُقَصِّرُ الْخُطْبَةِ Okay, وَيُقَصِّرَ الْخُطْبَةِ To make the khutbah short. The Prophet Sallallahu in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Amir ibn Yasir, he said, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّ طُولَ صَلَاةِ الرَّجُلْ وَقِصْرَ خُطْبَتِهِ مَئِنَّةٌ عَلَى فِقْهِهِ فَأَطِيلُ صَلَاةِ وَأَقْصِرُ الْخُطْبَةِ Okay, فَأَطِيلُ صَلَاةِ وَأَقْصِرُ الْخُطْبَةِ وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْبَيَانِ سِحْرِ uh, Yasir, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, he narrates this hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu said that when a person lengthens his prayer, yani the Jummah prayer, and he shortens the khutbah, but shortening in a way which is valid, not leaving anything which is important out and being comprehensive enough and he shortens his khutbah, then this is a sign of one's understanding. That this is a sign of one's fiqh, that he has an understanding of the objectives of the Sharia. Okay, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ said, extend the salah and shorten the khutbah. And he said, verily from speech there is magic. Some people, they have magic in their speech. And the ulama, they explained that one of the reasons for the khutbah to be short, in fact, is that, of course, if the khutbah is too long, like this lesson is getting quite long now, if the khutbah is too long, then people, they're going to lose concentration, number one. Number two, they won't be able to retain the benefits of what was being said. Okay, they won't be able to retain the benefits of what was being said. And that loses an objective. The author says, and from the sunnan, وَيَدْعُوا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ And from the sunnan is that the Imam, he makes a benefit of dua, not for himself, but rather from the Muslims in general. And it's permissible also to make dua for any individual Muslim if there is a benefit in doing that. Okay, And also, uh, why the Imam should make um, dua upon the member for the Muslims is because this could be a time of istijaba. This could be a time where the dua is going to be answered and it's something which is highly recommended to do. And the hadith which is authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, he said that the Prophet sallallahu said, مَنْ إِسْتَغْفِرَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِكُلِّ مُؤْمِنٍ وَمُؤْمِنَةٍ حسنة. That whoever seeks forgiveness for the believing men and women, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives for that person, 
uh, with each believing man and woman a hasana. So you can imagine that when you say Allahumma ghfir lil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat that Allah forgive the believing uh, men and women, the Muslims men and women, the ones that are alive and the ones that have passed away, then for each person we are making dua for that we get a hasana, we get a deed. So that leads into the billions and millions. So it's something which should be done. Dua in time of khutbah is something which is imperative and the dua should be that type of dua wherein matters which are important to the Muslim ummah are mentioned. So sadly many people when they make dua they don't make dua about those who are unjustly imprisoned in the prisons. They don't make dua for those that are unjustly being tortured and you know humiliated in lands like China. You hardly hear uh, many khatib doing this and this is something which is really sad to the heart. Tayyip, question to yourselves, should the Imam raise his hands when making dua on the member, Salatul Juma? Question to yourselves, should the Imam raise his hands when making dua? Barakallahu fiqh ahsanta. It's not to be done because it's not from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Amara ibn Ru'aybah, he saw Bishr ibn Marwan uh, upon the member uh, making dua. So um, Amara radiallahu anhu said, Qabbaha Allahu hatayn al yadayn, qad ra'aytu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ma yazidu an yaqul bi yadihi hakada wa ashara bi isba'ihi al musabbiha. Amara uh, Ibn Ra'iba radiallahu anhu, he saw uh, Bishr Ibn Marwan upon the member making dua. And in the hadith of uh, Ahmed, he said that this was in the, uh, yani, on the Juma, making dua, right, raising his hands. So Amara, he said, may Allah Azawajal make these hands ugly, uh, something to that effect, make these hands ugly. Because I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he wouldn't do more when making dua than raising his finger like such when making dua on the member. And also the followers, they shouldn't raise their hands either because the followers are supposed to follow what the Imam is doing. Okay, so the followers also, the ones who are listening, when they make dua, they should only be saying Ameen silently and they shouldn't be raising their hands either. However, if we're in a place where people are so accustomed to doing this, we shouldn't make a bigger issue out of it. Rather, we should try to teach the people once we develop relationships with them and uh, try to spread the Sunnah as best as we can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That which was correct and clear was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Any mistakes and confusion, shortcomings, myself and Shaitan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to reward us immensely for this short effort that we have made. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us from those who understand and act upon what we understood and to teach to others what we understood. Ameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you have any questions on the topic, then feel free, inshaAllah. Wa jazakumullah khair for your patience.